Let's call the meeting to order and we'll start out with the roll call. Ms. Bex? I'm here. Ms. Harrell? Ms. Hetland? Present. Mr. Jacobson? Here. Ms. Jones? Ms. Orcherton is excused. Mr. Robinson? I'm here. Ms. Salmon? Here. Ms. Snyder? Here. Okay, next we move to approval of minutes of the previous meeting. Did anybody have any questions or comments about those? Okay, I move that we, oh, did you want to say something? No. Oh, okay. No. So you go from the mic. Uh, <laughs> you just bid. Uh, I move that we approve them as they, the, the uh, minutes as they are. Uh, can I have a second? All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, we do have an addition to the agenda today. It's, uh, we have Rob Crum here, and he's going to report on the Folk and Roots Festival 2018. And yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to welcome our newest commission member, Stacey Robinson, who's joining us for the first meeting that of, of hopefully many. <laughs> um, and I wanted to give you, Stacey, just an opportunity to say a little bit about yourself, since this is your first time with us. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Stacy Robinson. I'm an assistant professor teaching graphic design and illustration at U of I. Uh, this is my, what year are we in? My um, <laughs> thinking academic year. So I came in 2016. This is my third academic year, year here. And I'm um, looking forward to uh, meeting everyone. Some, some faces are familiar. And uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, guess we will start with the staff report. Okay, everyone, this is your January staff report of the Arts and Culture Commission. <laughs> yes. Um, we're going to cover some of these topics in this month's report, um, focusing on different programs that we have that are currently kind of in their um, activity. And first and foremost, just uh, to reiterate, after um, over six months of work um, with, for all of us, I think um, we're happy to report that we are officially the Arts and Culture Commission and that this was adopted by City Council and approved. Um, so we're really excited um, for what this will bring. Um, as you may have seen and in, in, in the email update from me as well, I'm really excited to um, think of this as a, a truly a different moment for also visioning for our program. So as we enter into another um, moment of annual visioning and strategic planning, um, which I'm hoping to do at an upcoming meeting. Um, this will be another framework for us to be thinking through the kinds of work that we do. And we're testing out the tagline, where arts and culture thrive. <laughs> Very short, uh, slight adaptation from our previous um, kind of tagline for the arts program. Um, Big piece of news that came out recently was um, news about an Urbana Arts development. So this is uh, proposed as a, a development of, um, over the city-owned parking lots 24 and 24 West, located south of Lincoln Square across East Illinois Street. This would be an affordable housing project um, with six artists live in um, live work units on the ground floor, as well as an arts and cultural center to be operated by the arts and culture program. Um, so that would mean that um, the offices of staff for the arts and culture program would be there, and um, that we would also have space to do things like our events and programs and um, and right. all sorts of uh, of things that we have really made possible through the arts program would have a home. So that's really exciting um, for this commission in particular. And as that um, becomes more and more explored, we'll have more news down the pipeline um, regarding Urbana Arts, but that's something certainly for this commission to keep our eye on and be thinking about. Um, we're also really interested in feedback and insights from the um, Arts and Culture Commission regarding this project. So as I stated in an email that went out to all of you, um, you can also make an appointment to meet with, um, with me and with staff from the program to kind of talk about your ideas and feedback about this project proposal. Um, let me start by talking about the 
latest and greatest from the arts program, which is that we released the 2019 arts grant cycle. Um, and this was, again, really um, wonderful to have had a lot of wonderful feedback from our arts commission on how to structure the grant program. Um, as usual, we continue to solicit applications that really focus on creative projects from festivals, exhibits, to productions, um, and events that span visual art, music, performance, environmental arts, landscape architecture, dance, new media, and the list goes on. Um, as we've mentioned before, but I think it's worth mentioning again, our program goals have not shifted, but I think are really complemented by our focus in um, really elevating arts and, and culture in the city of Urbana. We talk about integrating the arts into the urban environment and creating a sense of place and purpose, promoting tourism and commerce, um, increasing the availability of publicly accessible projects in the arts, encouraging, of course, emerging artists and art forms, preserving and commemorating our local and multicultural traditions and histories, enriching the lives of Urbana residents and visitors, and increasing opportunities for residents to engage in the arts represent the community and its diversity and encourage partnerships among artists, performers, businesses, and organizations. So we actually share these program goals in each and every arts grant workshop we give, and it's in the grant guidelines through our commission. Um, and this is really the framework that we encourage people to use when they're thinking about how to propose projects um, for grants. Um, as we discussed, uh, and this is especially, I think, important to reiterate for um, some for Stacy in particular as a new uh, commissioner, but we have now um, really uh, revised our grant program only slightly to accommodate um, not only the, uh, um, the role of special event funding coming under the auspices of the Arts and Culture Commission, but also um, to accommodate some of the feedback that we've gotten over the past uh, few years regarding the grant program. So we've gone towards um, having these three tiers, tier one, two, and three. Um, one being small grants, mid-sized is tier two, and large scale is tier three. Um, as you can see, um, we have kind of a layout for both match requirements and in kind, whether it's allowed as part of match or not, as well as minimums and maximums of the expected awards. And we also have put arts in the schools, which has typically been on a different um, cycle, just slightly different timing wise, we've put them all together on one cycle now. And we've also added a poet laureate program so just to mention those, Arts in the Schools um, is uh, really intended to fund arts education initiatives within Urbana School District. And as I've said in the, the workshops I've already given, I'm giving another one tomorrow, um, the Arts in the Schools grants are not necessarily um, only open to teachers or school administration or artists, but anyone who's interested in helping cultivate an arts education initiative within the Urbana Schools. Um, obviously, we do ask that there is a um, concrete proposal that talks about the relationship with a teacher or a, um, a school administrator and artists, and so how that will happen during the school day to be accessible to as many students as possible. Um, but those grants, too, are going to be available within this cycle. And then our brand new Poet Laureate program, we will um, hopefully by early, or mid, I should say it probably more by mid-March, we will have a sense of who our, next, who our first Poet Laureate is for the city of Urbana. Um, and this is an honorary position um, where we um, really work together with the Arts and Culture Programming Commission and that Poet Laureate to offer civic events that really elevate poetry as an art form and highlight the work of a local poet. Um, this is open to Champaign County residents um, and they apply also through the Arts Grant Program. So all of the information about our current grants are available on our website at urbanaillinois.us backslash arts grants. Um, and including a separate application for Poet Laureate and Arts in the Schools because they have slightly different criteria. And excuse my cough drop, I'm really trying not to cough right now. <laughs> um, so one thing I want to mention is, of course, as, as in previous years, we're offering grants workshops to support folks who are interested in applying and maybe want to get some ideas of best practices um, as they're writing their grants. We have grant workshops offered at the following locations. And I'll just pull up the dates here. They're a little small for you to read. But the next one is tomorrow at 11 AM at Salt and Light in Urbana in one of their new education classrooms, which I'm really excited to be in. Um, Salt and Light is also looking forward to doing lots more community engagement events and educational things um, that they're offering to the community. So this will be one of those. And um, I'm happy to be also going to Common Ground Food Co-op, the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois, the Urbana Free Library, and the Garrett's Gallery at Parkland College. And I also already visited the Urbana Champaign Independent Media Center. 
Um, so really trying to get the word out as much as possible. And then upon request, I'm, I'm willing to meet with people. I've encouraged people to go first to a grants workshop and then let me know if they still need a meeting after that because we get a lot of requests this tiny year for um, just support and, and suggestions with the grant program. Moving right along, I'm just, I'm just going to mention the um, uh, Open Scene Open Mic it continues to be flourishing and exciting for us. Um, one of the things that I'm excited to share is that Open Scene Open Mic's next um, uh, one is actually tomorrow evening. So if you're looking for something to do, please come out and support um, Kevin Tajay, who's from the Dose Foundation, Dreams Organized Simply by Effort. I finally learned the acronym. <laughs> and I'm really excited to um, have Kevin up on the mic. He's a performer, so it will also hopefully get some theater and some poetry um, from his own work being shared, as well as um, opportunities for anyone to come up at the mic and share any kind of performance, um, written work, knock knock joke, anything you want to share at the <laughs> mic. Um, but that'll be tomorrow evening at um, 6 p.m. Excuse me, this should say 6.30 p.m. at the Iron Post. Um, and then I also just want to mention that we're working with each uh, host to also tell us a little bit about what art means to them. And I've been working on a media campaign that shares um, kind of their vision for what um, art's role is in the lives of others and in, in their own personal lives. And we're sharing that um, on each open scene, open mic, and on our social media pages. So you'll kind of see that go around. But this is uh, Kevin's that he shared. Art is the freedom that the world tries to refuse me. And I'm really excited about all of these. Um, lastly, a couple other open scene updates. Uh, we have really been working to schedule this entire spring's worth of open scenes, so this will, um, you'll continue to see it as a monthly open mic night. Um, but we are adding a special one on February 1st um, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Independent Media Center. We're going to do a Black Herstory Slam, um, and this is a really exciting, it'll, it'll be a little bit different than an open mic. Um, depending on timing, we may have time at the end for a general open mic, but all of the um, this will be a slam that actually has pre-arranged um, speakers and performers. And so that will be um, in conjunction with the Love for All Poetry Crawl, which is part of Urbana First Fridays, um, an annual kind of celebration of poetry. So it'll be on that listing of events, too. Um, so check that out on First Fridays in February. And then after that, on February 13th, that's kind of like a Love, love continues because it's the day before Valentine's Day. We'll have DJ Silky um, hosting at Arcadia. You may remember DJ Silky being on the agenda to have hosted before, and we had a, a, a snafu with the heat in the IMC and had to reschedule. So um, this is the rescheduling of that one, and we're excited to have that at Arcadia. It's in conjunction with a new program that they have called Talks on the Rocks. Now I want to mention this month's Art Now. Um, it features Kelly Hieronymus, who's a visual artist. Um, her work is, is um, really inspired by aerial views. So um, her uh, and her partner have, a, uh, have in the past had a flight school. And so you'll see the plane at the bottom of your screen. Uh, she'll go up in the plane and actually look from on high and, and see lots of, um, and actually draw a lot of the things that she sees. So, a lot of the, pic, um, the images that she uses are actually images from our very own area. Um, her piece, South Farm Number no. 9, is currently um, this past cycle selection for murals on glass. So we, um, the Public Arts Program, were happy to have installed that at um, Phillips Recreation Center through the, with the Urbana Park District, so you'll probably remember that. Um, but she has a wonderful story about how she got into really taking this particular perspective when she's making work. And so we encourage you to view that. It airs, um, again, every Monday and Tuesday on UPTV, and we have a YouTube link. I've continued to also work here and again with Smile Politely to do a written adaptation of Art Now. And I've also um, received interest from 60, which is um, short for 60 Inches from Center. It's another um, uh, wonderful publication that's working predominantly often with Chicago-based artists, but has really tried to expand into featuring more Central Illinois artists. So we're hoping to get Art Now featured in 60 and are working with Tempest Hazel. You may rec recognize her name because we funded a project called Beyond Alternatives this past cycle as well, and we brought Tempest to this area. She was really interested in connecting um, with Urbana and learning more about the local artists that we have here. So that's kind of an interesting Great. outcome of an Urbana Arts Grant that we're hoping to continue to work with 60 to feature more of our local artists. 
Um, I also want to just mention our artists of the corridor. <clears throat> we have uh, currently I Like to Jump on a Horse by Angela Balduz is the exhibit on display. Um, I'm excited that we have a presentation this evening from Celeste Choate, so she may say more about Artists of the Corridor. But for the time being, I'll simply say this is a dual site exhibition series um, between the Urbana Public Arts Program and the Urbana Free Library. So we had a wonderful artist talk with Angela, and I'm excited to also announce that our next is called Hard to Place, um, and it's a collection of oil paintings by Natalie Pavoni. And that will also be installed and have um, an opening and closing reception soon to be announced um, through our website, social media pages, et cetera. I want to mention that Art in the Square continues. Um, we have this Saturday coming up, Hot Club of Urbana. Um, they play gypsy jazz inspired music um, and will be performing at 10 a.m. at the Market in the Square, hosted by the Urbana Business Association inside Lincoln Square Mall. Um, I've got the performances happening kind of kitty corner from Stango up on the stairs that kind of function as a stage. And that's been really wonderful. So come meet us over there if you come out to the market at 10 a.m. Um, Melvin Knight is next on the agenda for February 9th. Um, so he'll be performing some soul music at the Urbana Farmers Market. And we're excited to see that too. And I also want to mention Young Artist Studio. Um, our December 16th workshop featured tissue paper painting led by the staff of the Urbana Arts and Culture Program. This, of course, is again a, a wonderful collaboration with the Urbana Free Library. Our next installment features local artist Elizabeth Simpson doing a color collage workshop on January 27th at 3 p.m. Um, I continue to be in communication with the Illinois Marathon about how we will incorporate races in particular into the marathon's um, work and, and kind of highlighting the sculpture during the marathon itself. So I hope to have some more updates for that next month. And we also have our downtown events series as a partnership between Urbana Park District, 40 North Champaign County Arts Council, the Urbana Business Association, and the Public Arts Program, or the Urbana Arts and Culture Program, working together to create um, a downtown events series. Um, as it's currently being discussed, we're talking about a um, monthly, every fourth Saturday um, occurrence that would be on Main Street, most likely, in downtown Urbana. Um, would feature live concerts and, and other things going on in our downtown to make a real splash in the downtown area. And then our social media report shows an increase in Facebook and Instagram. And Twitter stays the same. This has been kind of, it's, and it's, there's reason why I think I use Twitter less a little bit for the program. But I'm interested in also um, learning more from all of you about different ways that you could see us promoting the work of the public arts program using social media. We also continue to always seek volunteers to work with the arts and culture program. So if you or someone you know might want to get involved and assist with events, I would love to get in touch with them. And that's it. Go ahead. Yeah. So on the website where it says you want volunteers, mm -hmm. there's nothing to click on. Mm -hmm. To apply for on our website currently. On our oh, website yeah. currently. I, yeah, I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had an application on there for a while, and I did remove it. We weren't getting much response through the website, so I was using primarily other things. But it's good to revisit. Yeah, I would say that because I mean, um, well, anyway, I went, and it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But the but the sentence that led me to go there suggested that it would be there. Oh, okay. I'll definitely take a look at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions regarding the staff report? Nope, except you've been very busy. <laughs> it's been a busy time. <laughs> but I'm excited for everything that's to come, so thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, next, we're going to have a presentation from one of our partners, uh, the Urbana uh, Free Library. And Celeste, I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your last name? Choate. 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 Okay, we'll be uh, talking to us about the library's programming and new art materials and circulation. We have three different handouts for you there. Sorry, we have four different handouts for you. Uh, one is our arts at the library brochure, which we will be updating very shortly. We've had a couple of um, new pieces of art coming our way. One is Megan's Garden in the back on the Elm Street side of the library. 
Megan's Garden has a mural by Glenn Davies. It's a sunken garden that you can see from mm -hmm. the children's department as you look out. And this fall, we had um, volunteers who came in from the Master Gardeners program and revised the garden and reinvigorated it, um, funded by the Friends of the Banner Free Library. And so now the, the garden, instead of being a beautiful bed of ivy with a couple of nice feature stones, it's actually a garden that looks like it goes into the mural at different places. So they did a beautiful job re reinvigorating that, and I encourage you to come. Also, we now have races on the corner of um, Green Street and Race Street, and so we'll have to include those in there as well. Yeah. So I am here today to thank you for the support that you have given the Urbana Free Library over the years and to, to tell you how happy we are to participate in these different artistic activities and supporting arts and culture in, um, in our community in the different ways that the library is doing that that you might not be aware of. So we want to make sure that to get the word out that we check out things to people to encourage their creativity and hopefully you will be excited. A couple of quick facts about the Urbana Free Library. Last fiscal year, we had over 365,000 unique visits. So it's about 1,000 people a day coming downtown to mm -hmm. go to the library and then hopefully going to other places downtown as well and enjoying downtown Urbana. Over 28,000 people attended over 800 programs or around 800 programs. We checked out over 795,000 items. Over 50,000 people have used the public computers to write resumes, do research, and connect with loved ones. And we have uh, different types of creativity software as well, so people can, well, be creative and also check creative things out, which we'll talk about in a moment. Currently today, we have about 26,000 items checked out with a value of over $500,000. And if you include the ebook items that people have checked out, which is about 900 items at about $20 per item, we buy them in bulk, so it's hard to know, but that's another $20,000. And, and value checked out to our patrons. So we are delighted that we get such great use. And I have to say that our craft and art collection, the hands-on books that you can look at and be inspired by, the, the staff do a phenomenal job of purchasing new materials. And they love suggestions. So if there are things you see that we don't have, please let us know so we can add them to the collection. Um, one place that encourages Foster, sorry, Foster's creativity is the Teen Open Lab. Have any of you heard of the Teen Open Lab? In addition to Rachel? <laughs> Great. So the Teen Open Lab is a teen-driven space for the kids to come and hang out after school and be creative in the ways that are comfortable to them. It celebrated its fifth year anniversary this fiscal year and has had over 17,500 teenagers come okay. to use That's the sewing cool. machines, use the 3D printers, use the vinyl cutters, use the drawing pads, play video games, um, they sew, they hang out, they play Jenga. It's really a great experience. And what's wonderful about it is the attitude that the, half, the staff have. It's about what the kids want to do. So we're not there to teach them. We're there to help support their creativity. So a young lady came in and said, I'd like to sew a dress that looks like this. And so staff said, do you know how to sew? And she said, no. Like, does that matter? And the answer is no, it doesn't. So we helped her learn the skills she needed to make the dress. And it was really great. And staff learned some things along the way, too, because they didn't necessarily know how to sew a dress like that either. But everyone came together, and um, she got what she was looking for. And that it's just really a wonderful place. If you've never been, it's Monday through Thursday, four days a week after school, from 2.30 to 3 o'clock till 5.30. We have a 3D printing service. So they have um, different 3D printers in the Teen Open Lab. It's available to adults as well. So you can come to our occasional classes on how to develop 3D design, and then you can email us your order, and we'll print them for you, and you can pick them up behind the checkout desk. As an aside, we also have Hoopla and Libby, which are services that you can use, um, e-books, uh, videos, and things to be creative, or just to check out and read for fun, trashy romances, if you'd like. <laughs> um, Hoopla is fabulous because it is a service that lets everyone download the items they want to when they want to simultaneously. Most ebook products let you check out one thing at a time like a mm -hmm. regular book. So the benefit of Hoopla, if you have a reading um, club, a book club, is that you can all check out the same thing at the same time. So we handed out brochures to learn how to use those in case you're interested or sharing that information. We really love to have the print items and as long as there are books, we will have them to check out. But we also like to support people looking at things in different ways. And knowing that you can always have a book with you when you have your phone is a powerful thing. A couple of years back, we started hands-on experiential learning kits. 
So we have all these different kinds of objects. We've got globes, we've got models of the brain that you can check out because people learn different ways and have different interests. So you can download a book and keep it on your phone. You can go to Amazon and do that for 99 cents, which many people do. But you can't download a telescope or a microscope, which is a friend of mine at Ann Arbor District Library used to always say that. There's, there's a place for libraries in this new and changing world, and it is to have the opportunity for people to check out things they want to explore. And sometimes those things are not books or DVDs. They are physical objects. And libraries are good at checking things out and making them available and sharing the value of the tax dollars that we receive with the whole community and spreading that across. So these collections have been super popular, and they're hardly ever on the shelves. So here's some feedback we got. Someone checked out the globe and tweeted that she brought Mars home from the library, <laughs> which is great. And then someone else used the telescope to take a picture of the moon. We also check out musical instruments for people of all ages. These have been really popular as well. We've got electric guitars, acoustic guitars. We actually have a, a left-handed guitar in case that is what you need. We've got a mandolin. We've got a banjo. And we recently started a collection of uh, musical instruments for children. So some of them are individual items, like it could be a couple of shakers. Or we've got some things like um, rhythm sticks or bells that are set up for classroom size. So maybe 24 or 30 items in a bag. So if you're a teacher or um, a homeschooling group. So we like to make sure that people have different opportunities to be creative in different ways. People have told us that have checked out the musical instruments, whether it's a drum or a wah-wah pedal, and they have used those items to record music and then put it out there in the world to, to be downloaded. So both adults and teens have said that. So it's nice to know that people are excited about <coughs> the things that are available to them. We also check out tablets and laptops and Chromebooks within the building, which has been um, not as popular as we would have liked. So I'm here to say, please come in and check out a Chromebook and use it in the library. Um, we also have the arts and crafts types of items that you can check out. So for example, we've got the Sizzix machine that you can use to, check, to cut out paper or stickers and labels and decorate things. We also have board games that you can play, which is collaborative. We have a brand new children's developmental toy collection. So kids grow quickly, and they grow through the different stages of learning quickly. And if you've ever had a small child in your life, you know you can gather a lot of stuff in your house, and it can be quite pricey. So now um, people can come in and check out those different puzzles or toys or manipulatives, help um, people develop their brains, which helps their literacy skills later, which sets them up for lifelong success. And they can check them out and then bring them back in. We started with 40 items. We've got 20 on the floor, and they are all checked out. So we're working on stamping and stickering the other 40 items to get them out also. We've got these hands-on science reading and math kits because we know people learn differently. We have a personalized reading list, which is if you tell us what kinds of things you like to read, the librarians will look at our collection and other items and recommend to you titles that you might like. So Amazon and other places will do that when you shop, but we'll do that for you when you want to use the library, because that's what we're here for, to help in different ways to connect you with things. We have a productivity collection. People have checked out our GoPros to record different videos. You can check out a VHS to DVD converter and get all those old DVDs, uh, get all those VHSs onto DVD. And we have the 3D printing and a video game collection. So lots of things at the library that you might not expect that help foster the creativity. We've got races, which we are super excited about, and we're because we don't know what will happen on that corner, because of the uncertainty with what's happening with the MCOR project, we know that it's coming. We know that it will dead end there. We know that the construction timeline has been pushed back from 2019 to 2020. It doesn't seem prudent for the library board to decide on what that corner will look like at the end of the day um, for a couple reasons. One, part of the corner is going to be purchased by the city to have a greater turn radius. So as you're turning around, it won't be that 90 degree angle anymore. It won't mm -hmm. be as awkward. So we don't have a drawing yet of what it's going to be. So we don't want to develop the corner lot not knowing what land we have to work with. So we are delighted and thrilled because this is really just the perfect spot for races to be. The race runs past it. Um, the teenagers like to look at it, but I haven't seen any climbing on it yet or small children. Um, <laughs> we're going to landscape around it to, to beautify the corner, but it's, it's a nice way for us to kind of try out some things on the corner that the foundation purchased for the library a couple years ago and get a feel for what, what might um, do well there. We are taking public feedback on our front page of our website, so if you have ideas of what you'd like to see on that corner, 
Maybe you want it to be a parking lot. Maybe you want it to be a garden or a playground. Um, please let us know so we can take that feedback and as the board moves toward making a decision, that will be helpful to us. But this is really wonderful. The fencing you see there is temporary. That is part of the porch sitting behind the sculpture. Mm -hmm. The porch is currently being rebuilt as well. So a busy time at the library. We are absolutely delighted to have um, on a permanent loan, the Stranger Reduction Zone. Um, yes, I know. Thank you for giving us it for two years and for the purchase um, with Virginia and Jack. We love having the or, or sort of the corridor with the art changing in our little cafe area. Again, about a thousand people a day come in the library. Many of them walk past that area, so the art gets seen by many, many people. On the bottom, you see on the bottom we see Rachel actually, yeah. <laughs> and this is one of the artist events where Chris Evans talked about his art and how he does his work. And in the upper right-hand corner, it is Mr. Stevens and his family who did the All Around the World program, which was, sorry, that's Jay Sand, and his family who came and did a musical program all around the world with music from different cultures as part of our summer reading program, a grant that you gave to the library in the, the uh, park district, and that was a popular and fun event. The library also has a cute little thing where we have um, spaces for children to have displays of their curated objects. So in the upper left-hand corner there, you see the little kitty cat. A young lady made a bunch of um, kitty cats, and that one was named Popcorn. <laughs> and she uh, decorated them up, and these are little built-in displays that are lit. And it's really special for the kids to come in with, whether it's the rock collection or Lego collection or Barbies or crafts they've made. It really is special. And if you've not been to the youth department, um, come in and come hard right around or the corner or hard left and take a look at those little display cases. You also, also, also gave the library a grant so that we could bring in, um, with funds from the foundation, New York Times bestselling author Maggie Stiefvater, who writes about werewolves and other type of paranormal novels um, generally written for teens. She was fabulous. Uh, 175 people came to the program. She was very generous. People loved her, and we would love to have her back. So thank you for that. She was very impressed with um, how well things went and they don't she doesn't always have such positive experiences in, in smaller locations and so in, in a place with 40,000 people that 175 showed up was a big deal for her and she recognized that also we had people driving in from Indiana that had missed a presentation she gave so people from other states drove in to come to this program so that was wonderful too what's next for the library strategic planning will begin within the next month or two and we will be doing community survey as well as some focus groups and inter interviews so we would love you to a participate and b get the word out for us because it's important to us to reflect what the community needs as well as to reach out and let the community know what we have so thank you very much does anyone have any questions anyone? i have a suggestion please i'm very impressed with all the the growth of the library. I, I have great memories of spending lots of time in the library when our son was little, and uh, my husband and I are supporters of the library. Um, uh, one way I w would think you might try to get the word out, uh, do, you, do you go to radio stations at all? I sure will. No, uh, I would think WILL, Alex Ruggieri, Central, uh, Central Illinois Businesses, he's a, he's a champion. And I would think you'd be perfect visitor on his uh, station. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Just to elaborate on that, um, possibly if you have something, you know, anytime you have an event visually appealing or, you know, of some general interest, uh, the uh, commercial television stations will sometimes respond to a, uh, to an opportunity to get a, you know, a, a minute or something, a minute and a half that that will make their viewers feel good and buy the sponsor's products. <laughs> we'll take that. Yeah, go ahead, Rachel. I just wanted to take a moment to say that um, since I came in as the public arts coordinator, the library has been probably 
my closest collaborator. Um, and we have obviously a number of collaborators um, with the public arts program, but I just wanted to acknowledge first and foremost your staff that have just done a tremendous job collaborating with our program. So for instance, um, in particular, Carol Inskeep and all the work of Artists mm -hmm. of the Corridor. Mm -hmm. And I've really loved until right up till she retired um, working with Shime Carmody yeah. on developing and, and implementing Young Artist Studio. And of course, um, I just wanted to mention, even though I don't directly work with Teen Open Lab, it's been really wonderful to come in and we're often flipping the room for an artist to the corridor talk right after Teen Open Lab and working with Joel. And I know that a lot of the teens have been really like jazzed about some of the arts programs that we offer because your staff do a great job of like letting others know about them and, and Joel's one of those. When we think about things like the 3D printer, we have actually a fun story of having used the 3D printer through Joel's support um, to create uh, a 3D printed item that was given out as part of Artist of the Corridor's artist talk. I don't know if you remember this, but it was I like don't. little 3D printed guinea pigs that complemented <laughs> oh, Lydia yes. Pudicum's like oh, work, right, which you'll yeah. recall <laughs> has incorporates lots of like guinea pig genealogy that's sort of mythical but wonderful. And um, <laughs> we had, I think, something like a few dozen guinea pigs, <laughs> planters planted so that we could plant a tiny plant in them. Oh, it was just to me a perfect example of how Ur Urbana Free Library staff just kind of like come together and support each other's programs and um, that was really nice and so I, I'm newly sort of working with Amanda and uh, working with Lauren and Elaine and I'm just excited to have worked with so many different people at the library because it really is um, tremendous how devoted they are to programming. So thank you. <laughs> well, and you know what a gem Rachel is, right? Oh, we do. Oh, yes. We are absolutely oh, we thrilled to yeah. work with you as well. And I will pass your kind words along. I could Please not be do. more delighted with the, my colleagues. They're so creative and so thoughtful and have so many great yeah. ideas, and they're willing to take a risk and bring ideas forward. They're not sure maybe if it'll fly or not, and the answer is yes, let's do that. So um, thank okay. you for acknowledging yeah. that. Yeah, you're becoming the new community center. Yay! <laughs> That's what we're there for. It's one you. of the many things we're there for. Thank you for sponsoring the, the Disney program at the Boneyard Festival on April 6th at 3 p.m. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we're going to have Rob Crumb uh, come and report on the Folk and Roots Festival 2018. Well, this is kind of a surprise. So uh, I surprised Rachel walking in today. So <laughs> she was not really expecting me, but uh, that's fine. So um, now this is um, a report for the uh, Champaign Urbana Folk and Roots Festival, which uh, um, we received arts grant funding of $1,500 uh, to support the festival this year. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate that. Uh, the festival happened in October, 18th, 19th, and 20th. So uh, if you had a chance to be there, great. And if you didn't, I hope to give you kind of a flavor of what happened. Um, the festival is a um, local festival. It's uh, all volunteer run. It's mostly, uh, it's heavy contingent of people here in Urbana and uh, um, a few musicians, a few other uh, good creative types, you know, are running the festival. This was our 10th annual festival this year. So um, if you had a chance to attend, great. And if not, we're doing the festival again next year. We're not slowing down. So uh, anyway, let's just jump into it. Um, this was the uh, festival logo. So this is kind of the, uh, um, this is what we came up with this year, working with a local artist, Brad Olson. And this is kind of like um, the Starship Enterprise as a guitar floating <laughs> over Ray Street. Um, you see the library right there. Uh, anyway, so uh, this was the 10th annual festival. We had about 80 performances in downtown Urbana and at the Cranard Center. So um, if you don't know about the festival, we start uh, on Thursday at the Cranard Center. We have a big kickoff event there in the lobby. And we did that again this year. And then we started, uh, we actually had some things going on in downtown Urbana on Thursday evening and then all, all Friday evening and all day Saturday. Uh, performances and dances and lots of workshops. Um, many of the festival events are free and so uh, for instance 
um, the Saturday of the festival, all day, which was the 20th this year, so uh, uh, all day from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m., all the events were free. And that, uh, that's one of the um, kind of the working dynamics of the festival. We want to try to keep the festival uh, accessible to everybody. And so we do a lot of family-friendly events on Saturday, and so we really encourage people to bring, you know, their family, their children, um, have the children bring the parents, have the parents bring their children, the neighborhood <laughs> children, whoever. So, uh, so we had about us. Uh, we had a, a little over 1,500 people. Um, the the tallying is always a, a little bit of a guesstimate. Uh, there's people everywhere in downtown Urbana. Kind of, some of the, it's the best estimate the moving mass. So the grant funding we we received this year helped to pre, uh, pay for the printing of festival T-shirts and some space rental some equipment and graphic design services. And again, we, we do thank, thank you for the funding. So this is uh, uh, Diane Marlin. She's, uh, she's one of our cheerleaders. So we gave her a t-shirt and a poster and she was uh, happy to model that for us. So this is a little aerial image uh, of downtown Urbana that just shows where uh, everything was located. So we try to really focus on the intersection of Maine and race and then uh, Every, everything's indoors for this festival, okay? If you, if you haven't been, it's an it's a indoor festival, and we try to use um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, uh, venues in downtown Urbana, the Rose Bowl. Um, we used the Cohen Building there at the corner of Maiden Race this year. Um, that was great. The Community Center for the Arts right across the street, and then the Sipyard, Busey Bank, and Blackbird, Iron Post, of course, the Urbana Free Library, and, uh, we also used the Urbana First United Methodist Church this year for the first year ever, and that worked out really well. And then the Cranert Center, of course. So, um, um, so the the one uh, one thing about the festival is it's a downtown event, and so we try to just get people there. Everything's within easy walking distance. All right, so I'll just uh, show a few bunch of slides of what happened. This is a festival kickoff party at the Cranert Center. This is a band, So Monarchus. Um, they're a, a Mexican-American and a Latin fusion band. They play all original materials. Uh, this, they've never played in Champaign-Urbana before, and this is just uh, this is a perfect fit for the festival and for the Cranert Center. This is the kind of band I think really Cranert Center should have um, all the time. These these are a younger group of younger musicians, very talented, and they were very uh, very happy to be here. So. Uh, um, we had a late night set at the Blackbird, which was another, uh, this is the first year we used the Blackbird on Main Street. And so this is a band called the Mighty Pines, they're from St. Louis. So we had them at the Blackbird, kind of a late event on Thursday. Um, we have this uh, great <laughs> Pipers, uh, group of Pipers, that, um, this one gentleman there in the, uh, in the one picture, um, uh, he usually comes out solo to kind of give a, get the festival started and um, so this was at the Sipyard and if you were in downtown um, that night you could hear these people there's no <laughs> doubt this was uh, quite quite a racket um, it was pretty cool um, so they, they played outside there at Sipyard and um, I don't think they quite peeled any paint off the walls there but they tried so it was fun we had a family friendly uh, festival event at their band free library that night this is a uh, Cody Jensen and Charlie Harris and, and Sam Payne and then uh, Cody's brother Rob came and um, these gentlemen, um, uh, Charlie and Cody, are um, they're very involved with the festival and uh, they've really been working uh, as part of the festival team this year and the last couple of years to help us with bookings and um, you know we have a really great uh, group of, of younger musicians in town and I just I just can't say enough about them and and. Uh, how much help they've been for the festival. So um, the arts program is part of a network of supporters and donors. There are some of uh, the other donors and supporters. I'm not going to read through everyone. Um, we do get donations from a lot of individuals. So the festival is a not-for-profit organization. We get a lot of donations of about 50 or $75. Okay, some people donate a little more, some people donate a little less. We get a lot of in-kind donations, but it's a huge community effort. And, um, and, it, and, it, and it indeed does take a village uh, to keep our festival going. So uh, 
We have some international visitors this year um, from Waterloo, Ontario. This a uh, couple called the Ever Loving Jug Band. So we had they, we had them at the Iron Post. They played for a pretty good, pretty good group of folks there. Um, we had a, shan a sea shanty sing at the Sipyard after the after the Piper's uh, performance. So um, Chris Madden used to live here, and now he lives in the Northeast. But he came back to uh, lead the sea shanty sing. Um, we use the community center for the arts front room as a performance venue, and that's um, Church Street Ramblers with a couple uh, couple dancers uh, cutting the rug up over here. That's, uh, that's Paul Coit and Sarah, and uh, they're uh, uh, you've probably seen them out dancing if you've been to any any place with a little bit of swing band action. So, uh, as I mentioned, we use the Cohen Building this year, and that's uh, Kenna May and uh, and Emily. Uh, Playing there at the Cohen Building, so we use their uh, again, kind of like their. I won't say front room. It's it's the room that has the bank vault building in there. Right. Mm -hmm. So we call that the vault room this mm -hmm. year, and and uh, uh, so we had a good time using the Cohen Building. Um, the Ro the Rose Bowl is one of our places we use. This is Joseph Huber from Milwaukee. Uh, the gentleman seated there in the middle. We had really noted uh, banjo player and historian and author Stephen Wade uh, perform at the Community Center for the Arts. He was one of our, really one of our headliners. Um, the festival <coughs> events were well attended. Um, the Cranard event drew about 300 people. And Friday we had probably just shy of 500 people in downtown Urbana. And the same during the day on Saturday for all the daytime events and then about 400 at the evening and night events. So um, there were people uh, everywhere we try to um, uh, it's a pretty good pretty good scene happening in downtown Urbana during the festival um, th as I mentioned during the day on Saturday we do a lot of we do a lot of programs for kids of all ages so these are some of the programs we had at the Community Center for the Arts that's uh, Miss Hannah Ray there on the left uh, holding her hand out she did a she ran a puppet show and this other band where everybody's kind of putting their hands in the middle, that's a band called the Deep Fried Pickle Project from Chicago. <laughs> and we love having them. They've, they've actually been part of the festival before. So um, we have this musical mayhem parade that we do every year that we kind of parade up and down Main Street. And so uh, this year it was a nice warm day to do that. Um, we got a lot of, a lot of odd looks from people, especially this gentleman with the drum cymbal on his, uh, on, on his, he on his helmet. Um, we do a lot of jam sessions. I'll just show a few pictures. This is a pretty good group of folks at the Iron Post. And there are some more people we had uh, jam sessions at the Cohen Building, Community Center for the Arts, and some more at the Iron Post. So again, this is all the daytime events. Um, we had lots of performances and workshops at the Urbana Free Library. So we love working with the library. We work with Carol Inskeep very closely. and. Uh, the library this year we had just dozens and dozens of people there we use um, three different rooms we use that upstairs performance room that's right by the coffee shop and two of the rooms downstairs and um, you would think that a workshop on writing murder ballots may not um, attract a lot of people but that's Robbie Fulks there in the, in the plaid t-shirt handing out materials to uh, the participants of his murder ballot writing workshop so <laughs> It's just uh, who knows who knows who's going to show up where. Again, uh, this is the first year we use the Urbana First United Methodist Church, so we work with uh, Pastor Robert Freeman there at the church, and uh, we had some events in the sanctuary. Which, um, if you haven't been in the sanctuary, you need to go to a service or something there. This the sanctuary has those beautiful stained glass windows. It's quite a place, and then we used um, some of the downstairs. Uh, we use one of the downstairs rooms as a, for dance workshops, and we use some of the classrooms there. And that's a gentleman named Blind Boy Paxton up here on the upper left. Doing, he's given one of his workshops over there at the church. So, lots of workshops. We had Nikki Brown and the Sisters of Thunder from uh, Toledo, Ohio. They um, they played music that the sanctuary there at the church has probably never heard before. They were a rousing, rocking, um, they're called Sacred Steel Band. That's a lot, of, you might know Robert Randolph. He's probably the best known person that plays out of that Sacred Steel tradition. But um, this is a family band, and they were great. Oh, we'd love to have them back sometime. Nikki and her sisters are, and cousins are all uh, fantastic performers. 
Uh, headliner Robbie folks at the Rose Bowl. He brought some other folks with him, including this woman who's playing piano, sitting down. Her name's Linda Gale Lewis. She happens to be the youngest sister of Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. So uh, oh, she wow. uh, had some good stories <laughs> about Jerry Lee. I talked to her 10 minutes or so. And then a uh, you know, late night jam session at the Iron Post kept people uh, coming out. These are again, uh, the people right here at the microphone are the two of the people from the first band, Son Monarchus. They stayed around all weekend. They loved hanging out here and being part of the scene. Um, we received lots of comments. Um, I love this one. Somebody told me this is the best thing that happens in downtown Urbana. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, somebody told me that personally. Um, people love the vibe of the festival. Somebody told me it just feels like Urbana. <laughs> and so uh, we we have had a good a good turnout and a good success over the last ten years. Um, we have a lot of relationships with other organizations. So uh, we've kind of grown into a year-round community resource. We do what's called a winter weekend. We do our third annual winter weekend that's coming up in February this year, 14th, 15th, and 16th. We do uh, with the Urbana Park District. We do what's called the Roots Walk, which that'll be the sixth annual Roots Walk this year at Crystal Lake Park. May 17th, we do Folk and Roots Fridays with the Urbana Park District at the Lake House at Crystal Lake Park. First and third Fridays of June, July, and August, we put up uh, some live music at the Lake House free, and we co-sponsor that with the Park, with the park District. Um, we do a Folk and Roots stage at Urbana Sweet Corn Festival, and we also do a number of other shows during the year. So um, we thank you again for the funding and support. Um, I can't say enough about um, we, we have a lot of people to thank that we work with a lot of people over the year. We have almost 100 volunteers that help us with the festival. Um, we have ongoing relationships with a lot of the businesses that are venues like the Rose Bowl and the Iron Post, uh, our Banner Free Library. Once again, I can't say enough good things about Carroll. Community Center for the Arts, we work really closely with Robin Kirton, Urbana Business Association, the, the Sousa Archives on campus. Um, the Park District, I mentioned them, Sipyard, Cranert Center, Busey Bank, and this year we did Blackbird, and of course the uh, Methodist Church, and the Cohen Building. And so there's lots of people involved with all those organizations, and just have to give a quick shout out to them because really without their help, the festival would not happen. And then there are the 12 people this year that were on the Festival Steering and Booking Committee, and uh, we're losing a few of them this year, but. We hope to attract a few other folks along the way. Anyway, any questions? Anybody? Any mm -hmm. questions or comments? Go ahead. Well, it, it's comment, uh, just I'm now speaking from the perspective of being on city council, worrying about paying the bills, economic development, and so on. And I guess I just want to thank you. I think that Folk and Roots Festival is one of the significant factors that attracted the d developer of the arts center, the arts development that's going to be coming just south of Lincoln Square. Okay. Because you guys created an environment locally that said to a developer who is putting money together to help <coughs> us out that it makes sense to put something like mm -hmm. that here. So I, I think the whole city uh, I mean you're thanking us for this grant but all the entire city I think whether they're supporters of the arts or not as long as they're taxpayers uh, owe you a debt also of gratitude Thanks. Uh, the 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 other thing that I moved uh, to think about here uh, Naomi and I spent n over New Year's a couple of days New Year's Eve and a couple of days after that in Memphis and which was just so wonderful. Highly recommend to anybody get on that train overnight, uh, spend a day or two, uh, uh, in, you know, on Beale Street. Uh, but one of the institutions, one of the things that's there that was so impactful is the Rock and Soul Museum. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you all have been there, but it takes the, the, the it it's, takes history but of course many, 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 you know, there are visual displays, but then also lots of opportunities to listen to the music. 
uh, starting from the music that originated with sharecroppers and traces how that evolved as, as people migrated to the city, especially during the Depression, uh, e evolved into um, soul music, country music, rock and roll, blues, and how those all were intertwined and, 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 and they, were, they were separate but also related to each other, uh, especially in their case because it was in Memphis as this took root in people who performed in Memphis, uh, people who, uh, rec record producers who were in Memphis, uh, the clubs of course, um, and uh, radio stations. Stax Records. Stax Records, yes, yeah, Stax Records. Uh, so, um, the, um, so, you, so as I looked at this array of people that you're talking about, I'm thinking, wow, it, it wouldn't be a small job, but it'd really be a fascinating job and maybe something, maybe a corner of this new arts place, a kind of a museum, a, a repository of people who have played in Champaign-Urbana. Or they've come, they've come from here, they've come through here, uh, you know, they've contributed to here, and, and, and what a rich uh, repository that would be. So, uh, in case anybody wants, you know, another project to think about <laughs> being an entrepreneur for. <laughs> just what you needed, Rachel. It's just what you need. Or, or, you know, anybody uh, in, in the community. But, uh, but I think that would, you know, be part of a virtuous cycle. It, it could be a, a destination and uh, it would bring people here and it would also be part of the, you know, sort of that core catalyst for, for making events like this even bigger, even more persistent throughout the year and so forth. So anyway, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, I think what you're doing is inspiring on multiple levels, both artistically and in, and in terms of our economic development issues, and um, so I guess I, that's all I have to say. <laughs> well, I second that because I I remember when the committee when the festival was being formed and they appeared before our committee to ask for funding in the very first year. Mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty good, doggone good return on the investment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, next we're going to have the review of the Urbana Arts Grants Tier 3 Timeline and Jury Process. What's being shared with you is a timeline that you already received via email, um, just for us to take a look at together. Um, I didn't hear feedback from everyone in response to that email, so um, I guess I just wanted to reopen the opportunity to give any uh, feedback about the Tier 3 um, timeline as it is presented here um, with the dates. And I also am including um, what has been the scurry. Um, we talked um, earlier about me bringing a copy of the jury score sheet that we use within our juries. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, Janelle gave me a, you know, a great feedback that not every commissioner has participated in the juries, not to mention we have new commissioners. Um, so not everybody's seen the jury score sheet. So I wanted to bring that here this evening, really to use this as an opportunity to just once again go over the tier three grants. Um, mm -hmm. Now for, for folks, who, just to, to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, it is new that the Arts, um, uh, Arts and Culture Commission would be the, the reviewer of Tier 3 grants. And so that's an exciting new role that you all have is um, 
um, being able to, uh, first of all, make the determination of um, who's receiving grant funding um, for Tier 3 applications, but also hearing those applications. So um, you'll receive, and, and maybe just to go through this timeline quickly, I have it also here on the screen more generally, mm -hmm. but we have a grant period that's currently open. You know, we opened the grants um, mid-December, and we ask that applications are received by February 15th by 5. Um, on occasion, we've extended that deadline. Um, if I am to extend that deadline, it would only be for till Monday morning <laughs> or something like that. So it's not going to shift this application um, too much for anyone here. Um, but the Tier 3 applications and scoring forms, um, and of course, if you know we are to use a similar scoring form or if I'm to revise it a little bit, you'd be seeing it well in advance as well just to see it. Um, but the score form and all of the applications as I receive them will be sent um, to you. And the, the date I'm giving is Tuesday, February 19th. Those would all come to you um, as the commission so that you can take a look at all of those and begin thinking about how you would score them. Um, you would then have uh, till the 24th of February. Now, as we know, February is coming up really soon, so this is all going to happen soon, and then it will be over. But basically, February 24th, as a Sunday, I'm making as sort of the deadline um, for commission members to submit questions to staff for the applicants ahead of the special meeting. Um, I don't care what time I get those. It'd be great to just get them before Monday morning, <laughs> and then I'll plan to send those questions out um, and give them a little time to think about the questions if you happen to have any. Um, you, would have, you will, of course, get the opportunity to ask questions when you hear those live presentations. Um, but if you have a question that's fairly fundamental, you might want to give them some time to think about it because, of course, during a presentation they can say, I need some time to think about that and not answer necessarily right. the difficult questions you might come up with. So certainly give that some time. Think about that a little bit, and I will pass those along. Um, I'm suggesting that then we have a meeting on Tuesday um, that would be February 26th as a special meeting of the commission. And at that meeting, we would hear the presentation, so we would invite all Tier 3 applicants um, to give a presentation. We're not certain how many applicant applications to expect um, with this. I, I will say that um, most of the people who've applied for our festival grants um, may still not have enough of an operating budget or whatever to fit within the tier three category. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't expect, for instance, that like all of our former festival applicants plus all of special event applicants of the past will be applying. I don't think it will look like that. So um, I'm not sure what to expect, but I don't think you'll hear a gigantic laundry list of people that night. It probably um, will be a handful of applications and they'll be giving in-person presentations to you You'll have an opportunity at that meeting to ask any additional questions. And then um, you will uh, basically have, uh, on Mar March 1st then, is the deadline for applicants to submit any further information. So let's say you did ask a question and they said, we can't ask, answer that right now, but I could gather that information and send it to you. They have till then to send that information, mm -hmm. which I would pass along to you. Um, and then we would have a, um, you, you would be asked to send me by March 6th, if you're following here, the individual scoring forms that you are filling out. Mm -hmm. So if you'll notice, you have time ahead of our special meeting to kind of read and review on your own. And we do ask that you come with some ideas of how you are already thinking about the grants um, before we have group discussions. And this is true of our juries as well, if you've participated. We ask our jurors to pre-review and to kind of come with their own sense. And then we have discussion and, and people can influence each other at that point, but you've already come with kind of your sense of what you wanted initially. Um, mm -hmm. So then you have those um, scoring forms due back to me. So if you're following at this point, you've had the application, you've seen um, a report, you didn't have to score right then and there, anything like that. You get time following seeing those presentations to even think a little bit more on it. Um, give your scores, get questions answered and have that influence your scoring as well potentially. And then you submit those to me mm -hmm. um, by March 6th. On Friday, March 8th, I will send out your packet for our regular meeting scheduled for the second Tuesday of the month um, as they typically go out, which is the Friday. But it will include a staff recommendation based on my compiling of all of your scores. And, um, and we'll also not just ask you to score based on this jury form, but we are going to create a form that would effectively also ask you to analyze how you would divvy up the money individually and then we would kind of create a recommendation based on compiling of that information. Um, and so we would make that staff recommendation and then at our regular March 12th meeting we would discuss and then we would vote. 
And those are that at the end of that meeting, we should know the results of the tier three applications um, and grant awards for this mm -hmm. cycle. So that's the timeline with kind of how the process will go. And of course, you know, this is going to be a learning experience. We'll probably figure out through this experience things we may want to tweak for the next cycle. So we'll keep it as a, you know, an open mind, open door, working document kind of situation. This is what we're working with this cycle, and it may change. But um, I want to know if there's any particular questions, comments, feedback on this cycle as it's been presented. Go ahead. Um, so I notice that you're usually really accommodating to people who apply for grants, like extending the deadline, or um, uh, if they miss something on the application, you'll like reply to them and say like, hey, get it right, send it back. Right. What, um, I don't know, are there any like contingency plans for like maybe someone is like unable to attend the special meeting on the 26th? Yeah, so I've, I've talked a bit about that with staff and um, there may be, so first of all, lots of the organizations that I would imagine would fit this um, description have multiple representatives, so hopefully we'll be able to send mm -hmm. someone. Um, but the meeting will not necessarily be required, okay. right? Um, it's to their benefit, of course, that they come and answer questions and make the presentation. Um, but certainly you can vote on applications without having the benefit of that presentation. Um, and I mean, alternatively, maybe we could explore them like sending a video or something like yeah. that. But um, ideally, they should be able to send a representative or um, in some way make some accommodation mm -hmm. for being there. And then just the inverse of, of that, too, from the uh, commission member's perspective, the most important activity on this list is attending that regular meeting because you're taking an action as a body. So we really need everyone here, um, definitely need a quorum to actually take an action. The other items, um, you know, if you, if you have to um, skip over one of them, we would hope that, that you would still are going to find enough opportunities to, to thoroughly review those and, and get your questions answered, even if you're not able to attend the special meeting, say. Um, you we can wouldn't, watch it on YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> it will be recorded uh, as this is being recorded. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you'll have ample opportunity to watch the presentations if for any reason you can't be here. Do you have a question, Eric? Um, just the... Um, the media by which we'll uh, do all this, everything will be done electronically? Uh, that's the idea. <laughs> okay, sure. Okay, well, I, I mean, I, okay, I'll just vote that that's, yeah. that's really better. I think the fewer pieces of paper we handle, the better. Uh, certainly. So my inclination is this time around to use a, a cloud um, of some kind, so whether that's Google Drive or something, to share, of course, with any personal information redacted off of them, but like um, some mm -hmm. of that, uh, being probably the easiest way or some like a Dropbox or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and we have talked on this commission about like going forward as we really evolve the grants program, um, maybe in future cycles exploring things like grants management software, which might be mm -hmm. really helpful to staff. Right. Um, but for the time being, we have not <laughs> budgeted that for that. <laughs> Was that a hint, Rachel? <laughs> that would be really great to have some time. Um, but at this pre years, at present yeah. time, I think we can probably just make use of a cloud. And I know um, having been on on a jury actually prior to taking this position um, it was pretty simple to use the even like the Google Drive or something to share information yeah. Yeah. or maybe yeah. Dropbox or yeah. yeah or both yeah, yeah. Or both. yeah go ahead Eric. and I'll, I'll just I'll just sort of reinforce what what came before I think that uh, for tier three application um, I think it's reasonable to expect that somebody representing the applying organization will be there on February 26th, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Could you yeah. remind me, um, um, are our score sheets, will they be made public when, once the process is done? I don't believe necessarily your individual score sheets. Okay. Um, what, we'll, what we will have is basically a, um, I want to say like a spreadsheet that will have scores and, and It'll probably be like Commissioner 1, Commissioner 2, Commissioner 3, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that we necessarily need to put your names, but I'll double check that information. I, I will comment on that based on experience and legal counsel. Mm -hmm. Every, uh, everything that has to do with dispersal of public dollars, uh, once we've made the decision, will be foiable. Sure. Yeah, that's a so. Good, yeah. Um, so we we w one year we had our uh, all of our uh, all of the underlying information in the worksheets associated with our social service funding grants mm -hmm. in the city. Uh, 
I'm trying to remember I th who it was. It was one of the news organizations, I think was either, it was either WCIA or the News Gazette. Anyway, they FOIA'd it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we gave it to them. Uh, I don't know if they were fishing for some sort of malfeasance, but they certainly didn't find anything and they never did anything with it. But, uh, so, but, but I think everybody should be aware that, uh, uh, that all of these documents uh, uh, could, at the end of the day, be foiable. So, uh, so it should be treated as though they're in the category, I guess, of being, I think the right thing is they're confidential while they're in process. But once the decisions are made, the record of how the decision to expend public dollars was made uh, now becomes uh, we don't have to we don't have to publish it, but we do have to produce it in response to a FOIA request. Yeah. Um, and typically, too, I I um, as I do in my juries meeting minutes and any notes that um, I take about like the general discussion. Of course, our discussions will also be televised. Um, right. Well, I'll, we'll make record of and make sure that um, anyone who, for instance, wants to get feedback on their grant application, I have been encouraging and I always do in every grant workshop I give, if you don't get funded or even if you do, ask for feedback, you know, ask for information about um, that decision and I'm, I, I'm usually happy to share that and when I do, I'm, I'm not sharing like so and so said, <laughs> blah, 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 but it's sort of the general mm -hmm. um, feedback from the commission or the general feedback of the jurors was X, Y, and Z and these are some things to consider on future applications. I don't know if that answers the question completely, and, and um, but I think um, I'm happy to also clarify that, especially so um, with legal counsel, and bring that to the next meeting. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Yeah, that, yeah good yeah. idea. That it's Just better to know but ahead of time for us than to know afterwards. For certain. Yeah, right. sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, but I do think it's good practice to assume that everything is potentially public. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We all had that training at one point, <laughs> or at least I don't know. The new members will have to have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, questions about the timeline in particular or the date of the special meeting that we discussed. So this is that February 26th Six. special meeting. Again, not the end of the world if we don't have quorum that day, but ideally if we're asking them to attend, I hope the commission will also be in attendance. Yeah, okay. yeah I think we're going to suggest just the regular 4.30 time. It's another Tuesday. Um, it may or may not be in this particular room. We may set up in a different room if this room for any reason is unavailable. Mm -hmm. But it would still be televised and all that, in case you're wondering. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know if it, makes it, if it makes things worse, but one of the things that's really a nuisance is if you park in that city parking lot before five and get a ticket. Uh, whereas if, if any meeting that begins at five, people don't have to feed the meter. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe, maybe, maybe this wouldn't be a problem for folks, but it's potentially such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by then, you, you can't you park in Lincoln Square? Oh, Our parking uh, study revealed we have a surplus of 1,800 parking spots in the city of Arena. <laughs> So hopefully they will be able to find parking, but that is the answer oh. to that question is yes. And oh, sure, yeah, yeah. And, but, but I, I could imagine. But the other so thing yeah. maybe that I think would relate to this is um, making it accessible for people who may work um, nine to five type hours and um, allowing them to give presentations. We might consider yeah. moving it back a little bit. I don't mind moving it a little bit later. Um, I guess that's a question for the commission. Um, so how about we say this, talk to me after the meeting and I'll send out an update of exact time and location of that day, but as long as the date works, I'm excited to bring us all together for that. And of course, we'll get that um, solid pretty soon so that that can be communicated to tier three applicants. Um, similarly, I did not necessarily hear from each of you about um, a, an answer to that question about our visioning meeting, either being a special meeting or, and I think this may be preferable, having it just during our April meeting, and um, me ensuring that there's a clear slate, no grant applications would be allowed that evening. Um, so 
that's an option. But I sent that in the email that went out to mm -hmm. all of you, and I didn't hear back from everybody. So after the meeting, also let me know more about that so we can get that scheduled. Was that about a week ago or so? Yeah, a two week or two. Mm -hmm. well, I'll have to go back and look because I didn't that's see all right. it. That's all right. We've had a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, right. I've been traveling too, so I... Yeah. yeah. So we'll just get those two things scheduled, and I think we'll probably be good to go, at least um, mm -hmm. unless there's any concerns about the timeline. Seems like it's going to work for folks. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for doing that. Um, last thing I just wanted to ask questions about is um, for us to take a look at the jury scoring sheet together. Um, my recommendation is, um, if anything, perhaps fl flushing out a little bit more if we needed to. Um, some of the bullet points underneath the three categories that we typically judge in. I don't see personally any need to significantly amend our scoring sheet that we use for all of our grants um, for tier three. So we judge on three criteria just as a reminder. One is artistic quality, one is project feasibility, and one is community integration. So you'll see you've got these three spots. You can score it um, up to five, and then there's places for comments. Um, for Tier 3, I would especially encourage every commissioner to make comments um, in those spaces. Truly do not consider those optional. I would love to see comments, kind of why you're giving the score that you are. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll see that related to our program goals, and actually absolutely articulated as they state, our program goals are really um, used as kind of um, explanation under those three items, artistic mm -hmm. quality, community integration, and project feasibility. Um, so. As obvious, artistic quality, we really are just looking um, about somebody's skill set. So who are they? What is their skill set as either a functioning creative group or as an individual? Um, for Tier 3, we're looking largely at organizations and sort of what's their track record, what's their artistic quality there, um, that the proposal has creative merit, um, and that uh, they have what they need to complete a successful project. We also look at project feasibility, so how clear and appropriate is the budget being proposed? Is there evidence of careful financial planning? Um, and have they submitted a realistic plan for implementation and, and including a realistic marketing and promotions plan that's um, well, well fleshed out? Um, and then for community integration, we're asking that the art is integrated into the urban environment, um, that it commemorates local and multicultural traditions and histories, that it enriches the lives of Urbana residents, um, it increases opportunities to engage in the arts, and is representative of the community in all of its diversity. I'm curious if you have um, suggestions of any areas that you'd want clarification or to be fleshed out at all, or if this seems like we can move forward with our general scoring sheet for tier three. As someone that sat on the panel before, I think the scoring sheet's excellent. There's nothing necessarily I would suggest there. In some areas, I don't think the application encourages the person to share the thing that then you're scoring on. And mm -hmm. I can't remember the details. I'd have to compare the application again. But I remember maybe it's project feasibility or something. It's sort of like, mm -hmm. um, there's a place like a grid to put the budget, but they don't really have to explain how they're going to get there or something along those oh, lines. Yeah. So, so we're scoring on things that the application doesn't encourage them to understand sure. that this is what you're, this is the big enchilada here. You're getting scored on this, if that makes yes, sense. Yes, absolutely. So as we, when we amended the grants this cycle, I did flesh out some of those things based on some of our conversations earlier. So for instance, um, our, we hit, still have the standard budget um, template that we use but in previous years there's been kind of like a notes section to say what it is you're applying for um, and it's been optional and it says now it is not optional and you need to flush out Good. exactly what so if you say supplies $500 that is meaningless to me unless you filled out that notation and will be right. considered incomplete and I've been saying this at grant workshops like absolutely will be considered incomplete if you do not flush that out including things like um, artistic fees. And it should say artistic fees for myself as individual artists or for X, Y, and Z people that I'm working with, blah, blah, blah. Similarly, I think one of the things that we talked about before was something like um, there is a question in previous grant applications that said something like what, um, effectively, what are you doing to reach out to underrepresented groups? Right. But it almost appeared like to be written as if it, I didn't think it was optional when I applied, but some people definitely thought it was optional, did not fill it out. 
Um, and so now it's very clear that that is not an optional question. You need to actually talk, to, talk us through the steps of how you are looking to reach out to not just underrepresented groups, but how are you looking to bring in people for whom this art form is maybe not as, as maybe they're not particularly as represented within that art form, but how are we working to kind of bring the community together through the projects that we support? And then the other piece, I think, there was one more that we kind of adjusted a little bit with the grant application. Um, and that might have been a little, we changed a little bit like the operating budget pieces so that they more so reflect our tiers now. Um, and I think reflect like a percent, the percentage that we asked for in terms of match. Um, so there were small tweaks, but it really was to answer more, oh, I know what it was. In general, your project narrative has to have, um, it, there, this was always really there, but it's like bolded a bunch of times. <laughs> and it basically asks that you make very clear how your project meets these program goals. So it's actually these exact yeah. bullet pointed program goals um, in your project narrative. And then your, um, and this has always been the case, but some people do this a little bit better than others, that your um, marketing plan is actually presented as a plan. It um, sounds like you then addressed all of those because it was just like very like with things, marketing though. plan or something it would be like Facebook and we'd be like okay well what does that mean you know or whatever so yeah. it sounds like you've you've already touched on a that little concern. bit for future years and they're already out so we can't change much right now but for future years it may it may behoove us to actually come up with like a, t a fill in template of mm -hmm. a marketing plan yeah. because people some people really know what that looks like or come up with something that really makes sense like a timeline or and I encourage in the grant workshops like a chart or a timeline, walk me through like date, time, what you're doing, and kind of how that marketing flows into the event and even maybe the evaluation of how the event went um, or other things that come after. But yeah, that's not always, I mean, some people really don't know how to answer that question. And I think as it states, we give kind of a short explanation of what we're looking for, but maybe giving a whole like worksheet to fill out or a timeline, that might make more sense depending on the kind of project. Go ahead. When you have had questions from candidates, mm -hmm. in general, were there things that always stuck out that became useful when you were going through all this reevaluation process with particular pro problems that always arose or? I think um, it's more not coming from candidates. They have a whole mess of questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are, no, sure. I can't, like, nothing's Depending coming forward experience. as, like, the question. Depending on um, But for juries, yeah. I think more so is a question of, like, is this optional? Why is this optional? And so now I'm like, they're not optional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just fill it all out. And I think I've, you know, I've said that even last year in, in grant workshops. I've said, you know, you want to fill it out completely. If you're questioning whether something's optional, fill it out because you would hate to have your application thrown out for being incomplete. And, you know, as Jess pointed out too, you know, we're pretty friendly. <laughs> we write to people and we say, you know, hey, you, you missed this and I'm curious, do you want to have an opportunity to submit more information or submit another work sample? You know, I've had people, mm -hmm. for instance, they can submit, I believe, up to, I can't remember if it's four or eight work samples, but some will send like a work sample <laughs> or two. And so I'll write to them and give them an opportunity to send more if they want. Um, of course, if you apply at like 11:59 at the deadline extension, nice. you might not get all those things afforded to you. But as much as we can, we do. Um, and I, I just give a lot of these pointers in the grants workshop. This is the time of year when um, my, I mean, probably since we've been sitting here, I've got probably like 10 more emails just asking for an individual meeting about the arts grants. So I added, I think, three more grant workshops, and I've really tried to put them in different parts of our town. Mm -hmm. um, and I go, I go out to Parkland and you know, go on campus, and so I'm really trying to give people a lot of opportunity, and my default answer is to go to a grants workshop first, and if you absolutely cannot find one of the eight that you can attend, um, call me, and then I'll meet with you personally. No, that's fair. Or if you don't get your questions answered, yeah. you know, call me and we'll meet with you personally. And I'm still meeting with quite a number of people, of course, but that's just something I'm trying to ask for them to do first. That's mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. Like, we get a lot of questions. It's really exciting. I mean, the other thing that's really fun this time of year, and I, and I you know, if anybody's like, watching the public arts meeting right now, listen closely. <laughs> it's like the thing that I think is best about the grants workshops is that they're not just an opportunity to get questions answered about your grant writing, but it's actually a great way to network because I force them, and no, I don't force them. I encourage them if they're willing to share their project ideas aloud, um, especially because 
the first one that we had at the IMC, I think we had about 20 people, so it was a larger one. But some of these grant workshops only have a handful of people, 10 people or so. Um, we'll see if they start getting more and more popular, but um, because it's a smaller group, we can actually have people share out, mm -hmm. and then they learn that actually there's people that are kind of on the periphery working on somewhat of a similar project and can collaborate together. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they know a person that the other person should know. It's a great networking opportunity. And I know for a fact that a couple of the grant applications that we had this past cycle came out of collaborations that were forged at a grant workshop. So I think they're really worth they're really worth going to, and not just because I'm giving them. <laughs> I may be biased, but they actually enough. really are worth it. <laughs> yeah, and so we also have a sneak peek event. Um, I've been a little bit in communication with a couple different venues. I'm thinking maybe Blackbird um, this year, so um, we're working on that. And uh, you will, of course, all be encouraged to attend. Um, I think we had a number of commissioners come last year, mm -hmm. and it's really wonderful. If, if, if all, if, if not all, then a majority of commissioners can come out to that event. You get to meet the grantees, congratulate them, mingle with them, learn more about their projects, and it's really just a celebration. So that'll be um, usually uh, right after grant cycle starts, like either that last week of March, right before it starts, or first week of April. So I'll let you know, date is to be determined. Any other questions? Yeah. Feeling a little bit better about it all? Feel solid? <laughs> We're testing it out. I'm excited. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just guarantee you that you are all now better prepared to make these decisions than the city council ever was. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank wow. you. You've been elevated. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, re I regard this appointment as a promotion. <laughs> You've changed up our stature. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, that's really it. So it sounds like we'll keep, keep with the regular scoring sheets. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I didn't hear any particular additions to it. Um, I will. I will show you probably a spreadsheet of how the scoring works um, when we actually get together for for that particular meeting. Um, but I'll, and I'll be kind of taking notes as well, obviously. Sukiya, who runs, takes our minutes. So between all of that, we'll kind of have information about your thinking on it. Um, get these dates on your calendars if you can. Um, you know, I have not quite added them all to my calendar, so I think especially, um, you know, some of these deadlines, I'll send you a group um, Outlook invitation to add them to your calendar. Um, but, you know, if yes. you want to go ahead and get them on there sooner than later, that's probably a good idea. Well, we can just copy from this, right? Yep, you can yeah. copy right from this, and especially those deadlines of when you have to send me something, like questions <laughs> or your scoring card. Um, those are good ones. And I will do my best to make, well, I will make good on all the deadlines I'm giving, you've given me to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a busy next couple of months, and then it will just be a celebration, and we'll get to hear grant reports until the end of time, <laughs> which is really exciting. All so right. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Did anybody have any announcements before we? Oh, come I have ahead. one. It's um, it's on behalf of the the schools in Champaign Urbana and mm -hmm. the region. Uh, on the evening of February 12th at Silver Creek Restaurant in the greenhouse members of the University School of Music faculty and the symphony are presenting a dinner concert to fund, to help fund the in-school programs oh, nice. for, the, for the community. So tell your significant others that they need to take you to dinner that night. Because <laughs> <laughs> Valentine's Day is only two days away. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, I move we adjourn. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, we're done, thank you. Thank you.